Welcome. Thank you for joining us for First Person, Conversations with Holocaust Survivors. I'm Bill Benson, and I have hosted First Person since it began at the museum in 2000. Each month, we share firsthand accounts of survival during the Holocaust. Each of our first person guests serves as a volunteer at the museum. Holocaust survivors are Jews who experienced the persecution and survived the mass murder that was carried out by the Nazis and their collaborators. This included those who were in concentration camps, killing centers, ghettos, and prisons, as well as refugees or those in hiding. Holocaust survivors also include people who did not self-identify as Jewish, but were categorized as such by the perpetrators. We are honored to have Holocaust survivor George Pick share his firsthand account of the Holocaust with us. George, thank you so much for agreeing to be our first person today. Thank you, Bill. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, let us uh, uh, go and uh, start our discussion. Thank you, George. You, ha you, you have so much to share in a short one hour time. We'll start right away. George, you were born March 28th, 1934 in Budapest, Hungary. Tell us about your parents, Istvan and Margit, and their life in Hungary in the early to mid 1930s. Well, you see me here as a, a two days old baby. However, my family's uh, record and, and these are documented records, uh, go back to 270 years into the Kingdom of Hungary and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, I have a rather large family, or they had a rather large family, my parents on both sides. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in my generation, we, we were born in the wrong time. Uh, namely the Great Depression. So I only have uh, four cousins. Uh, my father was an engineer. My mother was uh, a uh, person who took uh, commercial classes. So she became a secretary. Uh, George, say a little bit, say a little bit more about that because I think that your um, your mother worked, and that was not so common at that time. Will you say a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, the uh, family men, the, the men in the family were all professional uh, doctors, nurses, uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, mechanical engineers, other engineers, uh, opticians, etc. Most of the women did not work. They were housewives. Now, my mother was uh, one of uh, four children. Unfortunately, one sister is di uh, has died in a Spani uh, Spanish flu. So she was the only female in the uh, 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 and two brothers. My mother had completed six grades in a commercial school. And the reason why that happened at age 16 she went to work because her two brothers uh, were going to become professional so her salary went to uh, to that purpose uh, one of the brothers became a doctor uh, but uh, he had to he was forced to leave hungary because of a very early anti-semitic law and so he ended up in italy and got his degree. Uh, once he had his degree, uh, he came back, but he was not able to get a job. And he always wanted to immigrate to America. So if you show the next picture. Yeah, and tell us, tell us about this, George. Yes. Uh, the aunt on the right hand side is my uncle's wife, the one who was a doctor, and she was a Hungarian, uh, she, she was of Hungarian origin, but she left in the 20s and became, of course, a citizen of, uh, of the United States. So they picked up correspondence, she came to Budapest and they got married. And in 1938, uh, they emigrated to 
the United States. Now, th this particular picture uh, is uh, uh, taken by him. Uh, what you see from the right hand side is my uncle Laszlo and his wife Edith. In the middle is my grandmother. You see me. I am one of five grandchildren she had. And the next man is my father, and then my mother, and, and, and I mentioned my aunt. The large family which they had, which was over a hundred people, lived mostly outside of Budapest. We had only about 15 to 20 people of my family who lived in Budapest. So the rest lived in uh, uh, smaller towns or villages. So a very large extended family, as you've just described. Yes, about 130 people altogether. George, you were just over four years old when World War II began in September 1939. The full impact of the war would not be felt in Hungary for several years yet, but the Hungarian government implemented anti-Semitic policies that immediately affected Jews. Tell us how these policies change life for you and your parents? Uh, in 1938, the Hungarian government affected or passed a first anti-Jewish law, which essentially uh, impacted all the professional people. Uh, many professions such as uh, medical uh, professions, law, engineering were overrepresented by Jews. Uh, Jews were roughly 6% of the population, but over 50% were uh, doctors and lawyers. So the first Jewish law, anti-Jewish law, uh, said that they have to be proportional to uh, uh, the, uh, the population. And uh, so therefore, many of my uncles uh, were thrown out of their jobs, among them my, uh, my uh, father, who was an engineer, and uh, uh, they were not provided any kind of uh, uh, livelihood. And so consequently, a vast majority of the Jews became very, very poor very soon. Nine months after the first anti-Jewish law, a second anti-Jewish law took effect, which was in 1939, which even a more uh, circumscribed what a, a Jewish person can and cannot do. In addition to that, that particular law also contained an important codicil, which, is, uh, which was that Jews could not be uh, regular Jew, uh, army members of the Hungarian army, but they could be called up as workers, as I would call slave laborers. And the first call up was in 1940, when my father was called up. The second call up was in 42, when most of my uncles were called up and that uh, impacted roughly 50,000 people. My father was lucky. Uh, he was uh, uh, sent back home after three months. However, uh, my uncles were not as lucky. They went to Ukraine, uh, where out of 50,000 Jewish slave laborers, only about six, 7,000 survived. Mm -hmm. uh, two uncles survived, several uncles did not. My father was called up again in 1943, and uh, he was sent to, which was at that point, uh, Buddha, uh, Hungary, uh, northern Transylvania, and now it's uh, the Ukraine, and he worked there as a laborer, as a slave laborer. His luck was again uh, ho holding up his, uh, the people who were uh, commanding them were rather humane, so he did not suffer, although uh, he was not uh, ready for the, and most of the people were not ready 
and able probably to do uh, physical work. Now, this picture was after he came back in 1943. I think the next picture. Before we go to the next picture, George, let me ask you just a couple of questions. Um, okay. During this time with your father losing his profession, his work, um, being called up to become a forced laborer or slave laborer uh, for the Hungarian government. During this time, how did your family make ends meet? Were either of your parents able to earn any kind of income during this time? Yes, my mother was, as I mentioned, was a secretary. She had the secretarial skills and her uncle, who was a hero of the First World War, although Jewish, uh, was exempted from uh, some of these Jewish laws. So he was able to practice law until 1944. And my mother worked there as a legal secretary for a number of years. Now, my father was an exception to the rule. My father had a great business sense. And he was among the few people who was able to work under the aegis of a Christian person. And this is how it worked. The Christian person would take out a uh, license to do business, and the Jewish person under him would be uh, a worker name, in name only for him. But in reality, my father worked with other uh, Jewish businessmen and non-Jewish businessmen and made a living. And then he made every year, every month, he gave money to this uh, so-called straw man or straw man. Uh, this particular person was the super of the building where we lived. Uh, we lived in a building uh, which we had roughly 20 apartments, and he was a very decent man, of course. George, and the, um, this yeah. way, go ahead. We, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to ask you, well, during this time you just described, were you able to start school at that time? Uh, in 1940, uh, the schools were open, and uh, I was enrolled in a Jewish uh, uh, boys' uh, orphanage school. Uh, th there were several hundred orphans, Jewish boy orphans, and it had a, attached to it was a coeducational elementary school from the first grade to the fourth grade. Uh, this picture you see is uh, my first grade graduation in uh, May of 1941. Uh, there is, uh, there is uh, myself. You see the lady who sits in the middle is uh, uh, Aunt Magda, who was our teacher, and her father, who was the director of the school, is next to her. Mm. Uh, the, as you see in the uh, in the class, there are kids who are in black uniform and very short hair. Those are the orphans. The rest of us uh, are in regular clothes. Uh, we had about half of the students were girls and half of them were boys, roughly 20, 25 people. And I went to this school for four years, from 1940 to 1944, until the Germans came in. George, um, with, with so much changing around you, and you've only been able to touch on some of those changes, did your parents consider trying to leave Hungary? Yes. As I mentioned, my uncle uh, emigrated to the United States in 1938, and uh, he tried to uh, sponsor us. You needed a sponsor to be able to emigrate. He uh, had a hard time himself, but he did sponsor us, and uh, the paperwork reached uh, the embassy of the United States in Budapest. At that point, both Hungary and uh, the United States were neutral. And But because of the policies of uh, the United States government, uh, the paperwork got uh, completely bogged down. And we got, an, a list, we got on a li list 
we said that we would have to wait until 1943 in order to emigrate to the United States. Unfortunately, of course, by 1943, the war was right. fully on. And so those those avenues were now closed to you completely? Completely, yes. George, um, you had an experience while on vacation in 1943 that felt very threatening. Will you, will you tell us what happened? Yes. After my father was... Uh, 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 after my father, father was uh, segregated from the army or uh, when uh, deactivated, uh, we went on a vacation, a short vacation in the Hungarian mountains. And my mother and I were work, walking in the woods. And all of a sudden, we were confronted by a yelling and screaming mob of uh, Nilos. Nilos was the Arrow Cross Party, the most uh, Nazi fight party in Hungary. Their ideolo ideological uh, stance was very similar to almost equal to uh, the Nazi stance. So they were for uh, the extermination of the Jews. And they were yelling and screaming anti-Semitic uh, uh, slogans and other things. So my mother and I uh, got very frightened and we left. And this was the first time I had an experience with these arrow cross uh, thugs. Unfortunately, not the last one. And it's, it's the, they're called the arrow cross. They call the arrow cross or Nilash in Hungarian. Nilash. And uh, uh, you will see probably in one of the pictures, uh, or maybe not, uh, that they had a, uh, a, some, sort of a, uh, some sort of a uniform very similar to the SS. Yeah. And they, it showed who they were. George, your, your father. Your father was called up again for forced labor in 1943. Tell us a little bit more about his experience. You did start to say that uh, he at least had a, a, a leader of that group who was, was, was a decent guy. Yes. Well, my father took this picture of his uh, comrades. And you see these people, they were not exactly, or most of them, were not exactly in shape to do uh, heavy manual work building a strategic road in the northern uh, part of Transylvania, which is now in the Ukraine. And they built a strategic road uh, for uh, the Hungarian and later on the Nazi army to move into and out of uh, Ukraine. And as you see, although, as I said, people were humanely treated, they were very uh, much, uh, this was very much of a, uh, a heavy labor for most of them, because most of them were, as I mentioned, lawyers and doctors and engineers. And here they are building a road out in the... In the, uh, in they, the are building a, a, they are building a strategic road, yeah. which was later, actually about a year later, was used for uh, 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 purposes of the war. And, and of course, George, by this time, 1943, the war had been going on elsewhere in Europe. Do, do you know if your parents knew what was going on with the war elsewhere in Europe and what was happening to Jews elsewhere? Yes. Uh, at 19, in 1943, or up until March of 1944, uh, we had radios and telephones, and in the radio, we used to uh, listen to the BBC Hungarian edition, which gave us a fairly true picture of what was happening in the uh, Western Front, which was really not a front in 1943, but most importantly, the Eastern Front. Now, we had, as I mentioned, in 42, some of my relatives, close relatives, were called, uh, called up. And we knew that in 1943, in January of 43, the Soviet uh, 
uh, armies break, broke through the Hungarian and the Nazi armies at Stalingrad. And at that point, uh, most of the Hungarian uh, regular army and most of the Jewish slave labor brigades were killed. Uh, roughly 8,000 8, of them came back out of 50,000. Mm -hmm. So we knew about this. We knew about the Battle of Stalingrad and some others. And we were, of course, hopeful that the war is getting closer to us fairly speedily, uh, particularly in the beginning of 1944, so that we would uh, somehow be able to escape on skid that didn't happen and that as you say that didn't happen nazi germany occupied hungary in march of that year 1944 bringing the war directly to hungary and to you in budapest what, what do you remember about the german occupation of budapest well i remember it was a sunday march 19 and uh, we were hearing this rumbling of the panzers or tanks uh, on the street and looked out and sure enough, they were Nazi, uh, Nazi uh, uh, units. And uh, we found out that the region, region of the, uh, or the head of government uh, Admiral Horthy was invited by Hitler a day before to come to Berchtesgaden, which was his headquarters. So he was out of the country when the eight German divisions came and came and uh, took the country in 24 hours. Uh, there was no exchange of fire between the Hungarian army and the German army, for the reason that the Hungarian army was very much uh, pro-German and pro-war. So they came in, and about uh, a day or so later, Eichmann, who was the most experienced man in the world, how to deport Jews fast and have them exterminated. And his little group of SS officers came to Hungary and immediately started work. The Nilash also, uh, by then, was very, were very active. And in the, uh, most of my family lived in small towns and villages. So only about 20 of us family members lived in Budapest. And the first thing which happened, the first days, they had dozens and dozens of restrictive orders uh, one was to uh, provide radios, telephones, and every type of equipment which would uh, facilitate transportation, uh, such as bicycles, automobiles, etc. We were forbidden to take any kind of streetcars or any kind of railroads. So all of a sudden, we were completely cut off from most of the family. The only so so not, not only you couldn't travel, even communication, as you said, phones, yeah. radios, all gone. Correct. Yeah. We, we had no way of knowing what was happening. Of course, uh, by then, the Nazis were much more effective in uh, disturbing the BBC, and we didn't have a radio anyway. So we were completely cut off from the yeah. world. And is that when you started? Is that when you? Is that when you were forced to start wearing the yellow star? Yes. Ten days after the Germans came in, uh, we were forced from six on to uh, wear the yellow stars. And roughly two weeks after they came in, they uh, conscripted all the men from age sixteen to sixty six zero. And my father was, of course, one of the men who was conscripted, and his unit was uh, uh, taken to the west side of Budapest or Hungary, uh, digging ditches, anti-tank ditches, because the, uh, the Germans uh, saw that Bu Hungary is going to become a battlefield. 
So they were able to, they were trying to uh, make the battle longer in Hungary. And so they already were building defensive lines way uh, west of the front. Yeah. Uh, my father was there until August. Now, there was uh, an important thing in uh, the provinces. Uh, the provinces were uh, uh, full of Jews. 75% of the Jewish people lived in the provinces, as I mentioned. Including my family. Uh, and my family. Yeah. So what they did is they uh, they concentrated the small uh, village Jews to larger uh, the Jewish concentrations, and uh, about beginning of May, May 15 to July the 7th, they were deporting them. And here is a group, a typical group of Jews who are being deported from. Uh, small ghettos into Germany. You see in the background the cattle cars where they were taken to, and most of them, 437,000, were taken to Auschwitz. In there, they were uh, the old men, the young women, and the young children were selected out. And roughly a couple of hours after they arrived in uh, groups of roughly three people, uh, they were uh, uh, gassed and their bodies were burned in various uh, crematoria. 90% mm -hmm. of the people who were deported uh, were selected out this way. And the rest of them who were judged to be workers or could work for a few months, maybe before they died, uh, were selected out and they were uh, put to work, very, very hard work. And, and George, the um, as, as you mentioned earlier, um, Eichmann was in charge of this effort and um, an, ex an extraordinary uh, short time, uh, more than three, almost 350,000 Jews were deported to Auschwitz over a six or seven week period, I believe. Yeah, 400, 400 uh, and 400,000, yeah. yes. George, um, as you mentioned, um, they also expanded the labor brigades, the forced labor brigades, and your father was sent off again. When he when he went off that time, did did your mom know where he went? Did she have communication with him? No, no. We did we did not know where he went, but we were very very busy in uh, Budapest. Mm -hmm. The reason why we were busy is that. Uh, they decided that, that the deportations uh, were going to end. The last phase of deportation was going to be ending in Budapest. However, uh, on June 6 of, G 6 of 1944, the Allied troops landed in the West, and we had to move uh, into small areas uh, which uh, were designated for Jews. Now, imagine that 20% of the population in Budapest were Jewish. So 20% of the living space was uh, in Jewish uh, uh, areas. And they were then short, uh, uh, forced to move to these uh, houses, which we called stars houses they had a big star in front and the building i lived had only two jewish families so i had we had to move we moved in a nearby building which where my grandmother had two sisters and their families and it was a smaller building only nine or ten apartments and that was a, a, a starred house now, what did the start house did do? Two things. One is to take uh, most of the Jews and push them together from a 20% living space to a 5% living space, which meant that each room had to be occupied by at least three to four people or more. So it was extremely 
difficult. So we were ne- not able to take our furniture, for example, mm-hmm. and we could take only a minimal number of things with us. Uh, this was at the end of June, and uh, the these uh, houses had one Christian family, usually the super who was left there, and his business was to make sure that the Jews are logged in for 22 hours a day uh, from uh, four o'clock in the afternoon to two o'clock in the afternoon of the next day. So we had two hours to get out and buy food for ourselves. Uh, And then for the rest of the day, we were logged in. Now, at two, between two and four, it was very difficult to buy food because number one, most people bought their food already in the morning. And number two, some of the Christian uh, merchants did not want to sell food to, for us. So we had difficulty uh, feeding ourselves. George, just to sort of summarize that so everybody understands, you would be the superintendent of your building would lock, make sure you were locked in there for 22 hours out of 24. And in those two hours, late afternoon, you had to go out and find food where very often the shelves were empty. Exactly. Yeah. You summarized it well. Yeah. George, okay. So, yeah. yeah go I was going to say, please, um, please describe for us life in Budapest at this time and how life was planned around the bombing raids that you've told me about. Um, uh, very, very, very profound stuff that was going on for you. Yes. Well, <clears throat> the first they had bombing raids since April, but uh, they were rather uh, relatively small scale. The first large-scale bombing raid happened on the 2nd of July, which was a Sunday, uh, to Budapest. This was what they called the carpet bombing. Roughly a thousand British and American uh, airplanes dropped thousands of tons of uh, uh, bombs on the city. Now, uh, most of them uh, missed their targets. Their targets were mostly railroad stations and uh, industry. And many of them ended up in uh, places like I lived. And it was a three hour raid. And each of the buildings had a bunker, which we went down, obviously. But uh, the bombs, many of them fell very, very close to where we were, a few, few hundred yards from us. And these bombs had a terrific noise when they came, and then, of course, a terrific uh, explosion. And I became completely hysterical. My mother tried to uh, uh, calm me down. We put a uh, a large uh, uh, something on my head so that the noise would be muffled. But from then on, I was always very hysterical and very afraid when they had these bomb, bombing raids. And these bombing raids became very uh, regular. Every day at 11 o'clock, the British or the Americans came with the large bombs. And at 9 o'clock at night, uh, the Soviets came with smaller bombs. But the bombing raid was on. This particular July 2nd raid was so devastating that 30% of the city became rubble. You, you described no. for me, George, um, the scene one time when you came out of the shelter as, as I think you used the word surreal. Yes, it was quite surreal. Uh, uh, the buildings around us were all in rubble. We were not hit, which was, as I said, almost miraculous. Right. Uh, but the whole thing was... Uh, Sm- the smell of death, the smell of smoke, and uh, some people thought that the Americans were dropping uh, thousands of Americans down and uh, they will have wars right there. Well, of course, that was an optimistic, over-optimistic idea. There, there were no American soldiers. Now, Varga, who was the super, was a very nice man. 
he knew my family for over 20 years. And he took me out in one of these raids and showed me how these airplanes uh, were going somewhere. And uh, I was afraid, but he told me, just look at it. They are beautiful. And I said, yeah, they are beautiful, but I am afraid. So we went back. Mm. So I saw them with my eyes of how they came and uh, they were frightening for me. Uh, there was thousands of them, right? Yeah. Yeah, they were thousands. Yes. Thousands. Yes. George, um, uh, in, in October, several months later, of course, you're, you're sort of living through all of this. In October 1944, life became even more dangerous in Budapest when the fascist Aero Cross Party gained control of the country. And then very soon after that, there were orders for thousands of Jews in Budapest to gather for deportations, including your father. T tell, us, tell us about that and what happened to him. Yes, <clears throat> my father's unit was uh, ordered back to Budapest in August of 1944. And that was a very good news for us. Again, he was very lucky. He had a very humane commander whose Jewish fiance lived in our building, actually. Uh, and, but he was a very humane person. And so, although it was very illegal for Jewish laborers, slave laborers, to move around after four o'clock in the afternoon, just like everybody else, my father took off his uh, uh, Jewish uh, laborer mark and late at night came home for a couple of hours and Mr. Varga let him in. He took his own uh, life in uh, danger because this was highly illegal to let anybody in or out. Mm -hmm. And my father was there uh, two, three times a week, uh, just for a few hours. And then he went back early in the morning. And uh, so between August and October, uh, things were relatively good. Uh, the uh, deportations stopped. He didn't know this. And Hitler and uh, Horthy on July 7 ordered not to have any deportations in Budapest. So between July 7 and October 15, uh, we were living in relatively good conditions, except for the air raids. Mm -hmm. But on October 15, uh, the regent, Horthy, decided that uh, uh, he was going to make a, an announcement on the radio that Hungary is going to go out of the war and become neutral. He declared neutrality. Well, it was a little too late and a little too little. Uh, the, first of all, the Germans knew about this, and in a couple of hours, they overwhelmed those few units who were uh, Horthy's uh, uh, bodyguards. They uh, took Horthy and his family to uh, and deported them to uh, Germany. And Eichmann came back, who left Budapest in July, and immediately started deportations. Now, there were roughly 50,000 Hungarian Jewish men in the slave labor brigades who were in Budapest, and roughly 10,000 young women. And so they were the first ones to be deported. And this was about seven to 10 days after the Nazis, the Nilos, took power after, he, uh, after Horthy was deposed. And my father's unit uh, was to be deported. The commander told my father and all the others that he will give them a 24 hour furlough and they're supposed to come the next morning to a certain uh, railroad station where they would be deported to uh, work to uh, Germany. Well, my father didn't want to be deported. He went to a friend of two friends who were business partners uh, and they were Christian and he was in desperate straits he said, I don't want to be deported, but I don't have a place to go, to hide. So they gave him a piece of paper to go and uh, uh, 
just tell the uh, the guard to let him in and uh, everything will be okay so we did not hear from my father for 10 days after he disappeared and after 10 days a, a soldier came with a very short note uh, that my mother and i should not talk to anybody else in our family but immediately come to this hiding place where he is and uh, we did we, we came there my mother was heartbroken because she had to leave uh, behind her mother and several uh, cousins and several aunts and so we went there and this was a hiding place uh, you probably have a picture we do we have a picture about to come up mm -hmm. okay so okay uh, this picture was taken after the war well after the war so it didn't look like that but originally the purpose of this building was a uh, factory a, a jewish owned uh, factory making material uh, uh, textile materials a textile factory uh, in the first floor there were looms maybe 10 or 20 and the second floor was where uh, they cut the material and they made uniforms hungarian uniforms so make the long story short this uh, uh, place became a hiding place for about 70 hungarian jewish uh, escapees like my father and my father uh, had uh, joined them and uh, by the time he came there it was roughly 70 people they had a large uh, logistic uh, organization very complicated because you had to feed 170 people and it turned out that this was only one of four hiding places unfortunately there was one traitor and uh, uh, that that uh, blew the cover but before he blew the cover uh, uh, these people these uh, uh, men brought their families in that's how we got there this was uh, uh, in the beginning of november a few days after the first of november and by the time we got there uh, there were about 170 people because everybody else also brought their family in uh, they were wives and children and uh, there was a little group of uh, young men who were running around in a, a nilos uniform and trying to be, bring as many people as they could they brought in maybe another 30 people young young people who were would, would be deported but they had a false papers and they took them in so george as you're describing these 170 or more people are in this what it what appears to the outside world as a functioning textile factory um, but it was all part of a very elaborate ruse. But you said there was a traitor in the works, and I think that's probably leads to the events that happened on December 2nd, 1944. Tell us about that. Yes. Uh, in On December 2nd, 1934, we were raided by the Hungarian Gestapo. Five people with submachine guns. Uh, they ran up and they said, we know you are Jewish and they sorted out the men on one side and the women and children on the other side. And we figured that uh, for all practical purposes, it was going to be a bloodbath in here and we will all die. But uh, these people were not stupid. It was December the 2nd and the Russian army was less than 30 miles from Budapest and almost completely encircled the city. So they knew that there would be a, a battlefield in Budapest and the eventual inevitable victors will be the Soviets. And so they, will be, uh, uh, they would be using this occasion of raiding these Jews to get rich. Well, we had a few well-to-do Jews and after a half an hour or so negotiation, 
but they did get a lot of uh, dollars and a lot of uh, diamonds as well. And they were uh, satisfied, I guess, and they said that they are now under their uh, protection. So we, if, if we have a problem, we should call them and they'll come down. And, and After George, this- I was gonna ask you, yeah, following that raid, of course, there were the, the 22 children that were hiding in there, including you, uh, were then placed at an orphanage that was protected by the Swiss Red Cross, but you decided to leave there very quickly. Tell us about that decision and, and where you went. Yeah, well, they decided that the 22 children were better off safer than in the Red Cross orphanage. So they took us and we went there and this was a right in the middle of the city and there were roughly 500 orphans or children who were separated from their parents. They were dirty, they were hungry, and many of the babies, there were many babies, they were crying, of course. There were only a few adults who were supervising, if you can call it, it that way, uh, us or them. And when we came in, I looked around, and I said to a friend of mine who was 10 years old, just like myself, and who came with us is one of the 22 children from our a group. I said, I am not going to stay here. I want to get out of here next morning. The building, of course, was closed for the night. And so the next morning, we went to the only entrance, which then opened for the workers for the Swiss Red Cross. And as the door opened, there were several people coming in among them a young woman, and we asked her to uh, take us out. And uh, we have money, but we are hungry. And she was nice enough to take us out. We walked with her for a couple of blocks, and then we ran away. And then we uh, dug in and out of uh, patrols. Of course, we didn't have the yellow star on. Uh, we, had, we bought some newspapers to try to hide our faces. And it took us roughly two hours to get back to our parents. And they were very, very happy. And, and more than very happy, you were turned out to be extraordinarily fortunate that you left that orphanage. Yes, we were very fortunate uh, because after the war, we found out that a few days after we escaped, uh, the whole of that uh, uh, orphanage was taken to the Danube and they shot, uh, Nilash shot them into the Danube. And, and this was approximately five, 500 children, right? Yes, 500 yeah. children were shot. And yeah. uh, they were not the only ones, incidentally. There were many hundreds of other people who were shot at the Danube. Yeah. But this 500, of course, was, uh, was hitting me like a brick wall when I found out. This all I only found, of course, after the war. But that would have been you, to, you and your friend as well. Uh, of George, course. After this, then you would end up, along with the other Jews in Budapest, you were forced into a ghetto. Uh, tell us about what it was like to go into the ghetto. Okay. Uh, you see in this map, the red dot, which was the orphanage where I went, and you see two yellow areas. The yellow area very close to the Danube was what they call the international ghetto. And there were roughly 15,000 Jews who had papers from the Swiss embassy, from the Swedish embassy, Spanish embassy, Portuguese and the Vatican. And this international ghetto was under the auspices of these neutral countries which was nothing more than a flag outside of the building. There were a few dozen buildings like that. Now, up until January, they were re relatively safe. But after January, the Nilaj broke in to many of these buildings, took, as you see, was very, very close, and shot them. Yeah. So they were, most of them, roughly 10,000 of them, were taken to the ghetto 
which is on the lower right side, uh, you see, and that ghetto was established at the end of November. Uh, by then, the Russians almost completely uh, encircled Budapest, and so the Jews who were in Budapest could not be deported anymore, so they uh, put them in a ghetto, roughly 70,000 of them, plus this 10,000 which came in the beginning of January. Now, the ghetto conditions were terrible. Uh, we, on the 17th of December, uh, were uh, forced into the ghetto. Actually, two uh, Hungarian policemen came and told us that uh, the ghetto would be safer for us unless, and they didn't say unless you have another place to, to uh, hide, uh, but we didn't. So out of the 170 people who started out uh, from our hiding place, only 65 ended up in the ghetto. Obviously the rest of them had some other hiding places. 22 out of the 75 uh, was housed in a building in a ghetto, uh, which already housed several hundred old men and women from uh, Hungarian Jewish uh, old age houses. I think there is a picture of yeah, that house. Yeah. Uh, this house was, uh, this, this picture was taken long after the war. Uh, this building had several apartments destroyed by artillery, and it was in bad shape. Uh, but when we came in, which was uh, the 17th of December, they had two rooms which were still empty. So 22 of us were uh, herded into these two rooms. But the intensity of the siege and the intensity of the bombing increased, and I was always a nervous wreck. So we went down to the basement of this uh, building, the building itself was built in the turn of the century, and the basement of the building was basically dust or dirt, dirt floor. And uh, my mother and I and a young lady uh, came down and we, we stayed there actually. But after Christmas, when the siege began in full force, everybody was forced down. So imagine, roughly 200 people in a very small place. Uh, they dug a, a hole in the middle, which was our latrine, uh, that did not uh, contribute too much to the smell and the whole well-being there. There was no electricity, no gas, no water, and uh, we were sitting there basically in the dark. Now, my father was, uh, uh, volunteering in a ghetto police. Now, this ghetto was very unique, the only ghetto in Europe which survived, and the last one. And the ghetto police had the uh, duty to try to save the Jews. And they got a truncheon, a, uh, a uh, piece of paper, a piece of uh, cloth on their uh, uh, uniform, not uniform, but on their coat, saying that they were the ghetto police and they had a barrier. And uh, I don't know how many hundreds of them were there. My father uh, was one of them. He lost two of his partners because when the siege started, they put uh, uh, sharpshooters on many of the buildings and anybody who was walking there uh, would be uh, shot. My father lost two of his uh, uh, people. George, and, and George, you you you've only can only do um, partial justice to describing all that you endured while you were in the ghetto. It was a fiercely bitter winter, from what you've told me. As you said, there was no heat, there was no water, there was no food. Your life was at risk to leave the building. Yet somebody had to leave to find food. And um, but on January. 18th, the Budapest ghetto was liberated, and that was just shortly before your 11th birthday. Will you just tell us briefly about your liberation? 
Yes, my father came home on January the 17th. And uh, <clears throat> as you mentioned, many people from our place and everywhere else died of hunger. And in front of our building, we had uh, a huge uh, square and thousands and thousands of these dead bodies were frozen up there. And I saw them in my mm. eyes. Uh, on the morning of the 18th of uh, January, uh, there was a strange quiet. We had only a slit floor, a slit uh, do uh, window on the bunker we are, were in or basement. And we looked up and we saw shoes, but they were not the kind of shoes which the Nilash or the Nazi would be wearing. They were different. And as I said, there was a surrealist, uh, the, the, uh, a surreal amount of uh, no, no noise, lack of noise. So half an hour later, somebody went out and looked, and they were the Russians were there already. Mm. My father waited until about noontime of that day before deciding that we would leave. We were not happy. We were all very weak. Uh, between the two, three of us, we had a very small suitcase, which uh, my mother always carried with her, which contained the family pictures. She always said that that was the only thing which, uh, which was irreplaceable. I was the strongest of the two or three of them, and I carried this thing. And we went through Budapest, full of dead bodies, full of dead horses. Uh, the uh, siege was on. I mean, we were hearing above our heads the, the tremendous noise of artillery fire from the Buddha side where the Nazis were and the Pest side where the Russians were. And it took us two hours to get back. Now, in this trip, uh, we were stopped by a couple of Russian soldiers and asked us to, uh, to break up the ice. And they gave us a couple of ice picks. Uh, my father and mother were so weak that they couldn't even lift it. So the Russians smiled and one pulled out a bread, a loaf of bread from his knapsack and gave it to us. Mm -hmm. That was the first food we saw for three weeks. Wow. We went back to our old place. Mr. Dudek was very happy. The pro-Nazis who were there were not. They thought we were going to take revenge. We didn't want to take revenge. We were too tired and too exhausted to take revenge. But we were there in the bunker with them for an close, close to a month because the siege did not end until February 13th. And George, of course, when it finally did end, your ordeal was far from over. But um, we're almost at the end of the time, so I, I have one more question for you, George, today, and that is, as we face rising anti-Semitism, related conspiracy theories, and Holocaust denial, please tell us what we can learn, what we need to learn from what you experienced during the Holocaust. Well, for 30 years, I've been volunteering in the uh, uh, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And I spoke to thousands of people. Uh, as you and I know, we, we spoke together many often. And I always finished my uh, discussion about this with the idea that people should be tolerant for each other. That unfortunately uh, no longer is the case. Uh, the whole world, the hatred of the whole world, is intolerable. And this is not just talking about it, it's the uh, popular press, the popular media everywhere. And I am afraid that we cannot, in fact, must not tolerate this hate speech and these hate actions in this country and other countries all around the world. So my last word is, we must actively fight against hate what, with whatever means we do have. 
Thank you. George, thank you for that. Those, those last words of yours um, resonate especially uh, today uh, with events in the world, and, but always since, since the Holocaust. Um, thank you for sharing your time with us. I wish we had had another hour to have you tell more about all the things that you experienced, but we are enormously grateful to you. Thank you, George. You're welcome. And you, for my audience who is watching me virtually, uh, thank you for watching this program. And I hope you learned something through my experience of what was the horror of the Holocaust. Thank you, George. I'd like to take a moment to thank our donor. First person is made possible through generous support of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation. And I'd also like to invite you to join us for our next first person program next month. Thank you for watching with us today.